In this WrestleTalk news, Sasha Banks not returning to WWE, details on Soraya's AEW contract, and Ollie's going to be here reviewing last night's Dynamite, so subscribe and enable notifications to always on for daily wrestling news videos. Support WrestleTalk! Now, given the endless supply of attention-grabbing wrestling news lately, it's understandable that one of 2022's other big notable stories has pretty much gone almost totally forgotten lately. And that being the ongoing absence and uncertain status of Sasha Banks and Naomi. Because it was almost seen as a matter of time before Triple H and his new regime enticed the pair back to the company, especially given the fact that their walkout from WWE in May was due to the result of creative frustrations. Well, it turns out that might not be the case after all. Because on Wednesday night, eagle-eyed WWE fans took a break from piecing together WWE's cryptic white rabbit QR codes to notice that Banks' Twitter handle has been changed from at Sasha Banks WWE to her real name of at Mercedes Venado. It has been well documented really that both Naomi and Sasha have been pursuing outside ventures while on hiatus from the company, with Banks particularly receiving more attention from outside the wrestling world through her role as Cosca Reeves on Disney's series The Mandalorian. This change may suggest that Banks, dissatisfied with just dipping her toes into the Hollywood waters, is ready to take the full on plunge. However, it is important to note that Banks still has Sasha Banks WWE written into her Twitter bio. Now, as previously reported, as of last month, WWE had relisted both Sasha and Naomi to their internal roster. So while seemingly unlikely given this little update, a return for the duo could still be on the cards. Probably still is on the cards. She's probably just setting out her stall. I'm me, I'm in control. I'll also be Sasha Banks sometimes. Moving on to another notable ex-WWE absentee, because Tony Khan's latest shiny new toy, Soraya, made her shocking AEW debut last week, confronting Britt Baker and her cronies following a post-match beatdown on Tony Storm and Athena. While it was fantastic seeing Soraya back on our screens once again, the return posed more questions than answers, given the former Paige's near five-year absence from in-ring action. Thankfully, however, a recent report from Fightful Selectors swooped in to provide us some much-needed clarity on Soraya's AEW contract and what it might mean for the future of her in-ring career. I'm sure there's a big clause that says don't drop on head. Fightful sources report that Soraya has signed at least a three-year contract with the company. It also seems the monetary value of the deal is largely determined by her future in-ring status. It says the amount of money it was signed for largely implies that she'll be wrestling in some capacity. Soraya appeared on last night's episode of Dynamite to proclaim that AEW was in fact now her house and proceeded to play matchmaker by setting up a lumberjack match between champion Tony Storm and Serena Deeb. She's gone straight back to general managing. You were meant to come back to the ring, Soraya. Now, the appearance seemed to temper expectations on an immediate return to the ring. However, given the teased brewing tensions between herself and Britt Baker, coupled with Fightful's report, an eventual in-ring blow-off cannot be ruled out in the future. And lastly, wrapping up this trifecta of uncertainty, there has perhaps been an update on the AEW future of two-thirds of the elite, Matt and Nick Jackson, following their prolonged silence following Brawl Out. See what we did there? Brawl Out because it's all out, but there was a post in several clips to his Instagram story, Matt re-emerged on social media to promote the official Young Buck shoe collab with Champ Sport, but also took the time to thank the fans to give us all an update that we oh so desperately crave. He said, thank you so much guys for everything. For the last 18 years, you guys have supported us and been so great to us, and I really can't wait to see you guys very soon. Okay, so there's not much to go on, but hey, it does hopefully confirm that both Matt and Nick will in fact be returning to the ring and likely to AEW once their suspensions are eventually lifted, which is more than we can say about some of the the other parties involved in the locker room scrum and bite a thon at all out. Isn't it a steal? Isn't it? Before we get on with the rest of the episode, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to this video's sponsor, AG1 by Athletic Greens, a nutritional drink that supports your energy, your focus, your gut, your digestion, and immune system health, which you can order right now from our link below. I've been drinking AG1 every morning for the last two years. It's the first thing I do when I wake up, immediately filling my body with 75 different ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Adaptogens. How many adaptogens have you had today, Luke? I'm eating chips. Then the answer is zero adaptogens. And that's why I'm better than you. I use AG1 as immunity support, as I know that when I have it every day, I'm getting all the necessary vitamins and minerals to fit my lifestyle. And it's all gluten-free, dairy-free, nut-free, and egg-free with no added sugar 
for maximum health. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash WrestleTalk to get started on your order, where WrestleTalk viewers will get a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is super important, and five free travel packs with their first purchase. Please do at least click the link to check them out, as every visit helps support this channel. And it could also be the best thing you do for your health in ages. Green that green. Now it's time for my review of ROH Dynamite in about five minutes. Excalibur declared this a new era of AEW, and by that, it appears he meant it's now Ring of Honor, which is probably for the best after Punk and the Elite ruined a bunch of your first company titles. The JAS opened the show with a typically sports entertaining, cheap heat generating ROH title win celebration for Chris Jericho. They even had Luigi Primo spinning New York style pizza dough in the background. They even managed to get heat on local Philadelphia pizza. Jericho promised he's going to make ROH relevant because nobody knew about it before he became champion last week and that it will henceforth be known as the Ring of Jericho. But that's his anus. While it might be a new era for who holds the championships, the almost year-long thematic clash remains strong in AEW. The JAS's sports entertainers versus Blackpool Combat Club's pro wrestlers. Previously, that was played out in the form of people, like Daniel Garcia, who's still stuck between the two. But now, with the genius inclusion of ROH, it's about the identity of a whole brand. The soul of wrestling itself. By the end of the night, Jericho will have set up one of the coolest stories of the year around that. But for now, the focus was on Garcia, with Brian Danielson interrupted and saying the choice is yours, Danny, while Jericho said he owns Garcia. Huh, a storyline about a sports entertainment guy feeling like he owns certain talents, trying to pry them away from the pro wrestling guy. Where does Tony get his ideas from? This turned into Danielson beating Daddy Magic after Cloud had to come down and carry out an interfering Angelo Parker. So much for those enhanced referee powers from Rampage then. Whether it was planned, a consequence of the Fallout brawl, or this week's Hurricane Ian, AEW had an incredibly tight focus, which for me made it far more enjoyable to watch. Taking the baton from the JAS vs Combat Club opening segment, we got the Combat Club's Wheeler Yuta cutting a promo on MJF, who in turn is feuding with other Combat Club world champion, John Moxley. In response, MJF somehow how managed to say Philly was where you live if you can't afford to live in New York, called Tony Schiavone a fat prick, but still massively put over Utah as one of the best wrestlers he's ever faced. Get the crowd to hate you while putting over you and your opponent. That is every major promo checkbox ticked. Utah showed great fire in his hometown, but the firm's ass boys stopped him getting physical with Max. For now, Mox retained against Juice Robinson in not a bad match, far from it, but I've seen them have much better encounters in New Japan. Taz mentioned Juice is a free agent right now, so perhaps this was his audition, particularly with his wife being women's champion, Tony Storm. The main problem with this match, though, was that they didn't cut to MJF watching from the skybox after every other move. He was up there, though, to cut a promo when Hangman Page, who has a title shot in line, got in Mox's face after the match. When Yuta appeared behind him for a great spot of dramatic irony, which led to a brawl in the stands. Page here. And this, in AEW, this is my house. But, but what, what does that mean? It means it's my house. I'm the revolution. Are you, are you gonna like wrestle or something? It seems a weird thing to not directly address right out of the get. I will create change in this division. Are you like a general manager? Lumberjack match. So Soraya cut that promo, got all the lady faces down to the ring, including champion Tony Storm, to be interrupted by the lady heels. Soraya then made the ensuing Serena Deed versus Tony Storm title match a lumberjack match. <gasps> I mean lumber Jill. I mean lumber person. Christ, it's 2022. Don't cancel me. Which Storm retained him? This was, in my opinion, a mess. It felt like one of those WWE segments from years ago when they'd attempt a soft reset in the most awkward way possible. Apart from Britt Baker, who was consistently excellent, it made every other wrestler, including your champion Tony Storm, look very minor league. That Soraya can just walk in and tell everyone what to do. 
but I get it. Perhaps this is a necessary step backwards to actually elevating the women's division in the future. Because my main gripe isn't so much that the segment was super clunky. It's AEW's persistent vagueness around their performers in ring statuses. The main question everyone has here. The white elephant at ringside is will Soraya be wrestling? So everything playing out now feels incredibly strange without that clarification. I'm not saying give us every single private medical detail of your performers. I'm saying invent some fictional kayfabe reasons for whatever behind the scenes holdups there might be. The acclaim said it's national scissoring day next week and Keith Lee said he's upset that he asked cheated to help them win. It's a shame they didn't get something in front of the live crowd. The Andrade vs Matt Hardy faction war will not die no matter how long it disappears from our screens. That appears to be getting back with private party. Ricky Stark squashed ex-ROH guy Eli Isom for some momentum and the main event saw a terrific clash between Chris Jericho and Bandido. This excelled on so many levels. From an in-ring wrestling level where Jericho at 51 years old is stealing the show week after the week on TV, where Bandido attempted insane move after insane move and executed every single one of them to perfection. If Tony hasn't already signed Bandido, he'd better do it now because Triple H will steal him. In fact, even if Tony has already signed Bandido, Triple H will still likely try to steal him. He should have been part of the original roster after he's all in buzz. But it was the storyline Jericho set up in the post-match after retaining with a lion tamer that provided the cliffhanger. Continuing that sports entertainment versus pro wrestler feud of ideologies, Jericho promised to destroy Ring of Honor, to desecrate it. He's going to beat up every commentator. He's going to beat up every former champion. Oh my God, I can't wait for him versus CM Punk. Oh. Or Seth Rollins. Oh. Or Austin Aries. Oh. Or Loki. Oh. Or Kevin Owens. Oh. Or Michael Elgin. Oh, no. Or Cody Rhodes. Oh. I'm being hilariously glib. There's more than enough in AEW. Danielson, Danielson, Cole, Joe, Lethal, O'Reilly, Roosh. Having Jericho run through them is a fantastic fresh storyline direction for the JAS versus Combat Club feud. He then even laid out ROH ring announcer Bobby Cruz with a Judas effect. What did you think of ROH Dynamite? Let me know in the comments. I much preferred this level of focus on AEW's top and developing guys. And the ring of Jericho... Still his anus. Story is one of the more exciting wrestling prospects of the year. That said, this very much felt like a filler setup show. Nothing wrong with that. Those are needed every now and again. That's why I'm giving this episode 79%. New belts are coming to WWE. Find out more by watching on. Welcome to Wrestle Talk Reacts. Hey, it's oh. me, it's me, it's Andy Datsun. This is Tempest. He's going to be reacting to some stuff. Hey, look, Tempest, what's that on your arm? It's the Jam That Championship, Andy. Wow, is that a belt? It is a belt. Wow, what a new belt. If only WWE were also planning on getting a new belt. What a segue. I know. 